In this video, I'll show you how to make a hippo, which is one of the easiest projects in the book because it only has a bottom gusset. Uh, here's a hippo, uh, the big size that I made using denim, used denim, and I embroidered it with a lotus. It was inspired by William the Hippo, who is the mascot of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. He's an ancient Egyptian hippo. If you Google him, he's very beautiful. And here's the bottom gusset. I used the same fabric for the bottom as the sides. And the back I haven't embroidered yet. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. And he has a lovely embroidery floss tail that's braided. Here's the charm size. I used a quilting fabric print on both sides. I, I, I fussy cut it so there's a bird. And it's got a decorative fabric on the bottom that goes with it. The fabric's by Fru Fru from France. And here's a hippo that I embroidered. I made him from solid fabrics. And um, we'll show you how to do the embroidery too. And also has a, a braided tail, green gusset on the bottom. Okay, so to start with, you want to cut out your pattern, your paper pattern. Take two pieces of fabric. If you're going to use a uh, charm square, you need at least five inches. This is These are five inch squares and um, place your pattern on it. You want to make sure that you have at least a quarter of an inch between the sides, uh, the edges of the paper and the edges of the fabric. And um, if, you, if you're using a print, you want right sides together. This is a solid, so all this, everything's the same, but you should be looking at the back side of the fabric here, and the right side should both be meeting on the inside. Um, you. Uh, if you need to, you can also place it like this. I'm not doing that for this video because it's easier to understand if I if I show it straight across. But you can place it at an angle. Uh, once you've got it where you like it, just throw a pin in there. Okay, and now we're going to trace it. And uh, we're going to trace around the entire thing, and plus we're going to trace the end points of the bottom gusset. So here, I'll just put a hashtag there and a, ha a hash, a hash mark there, a hash mark there. And now I'm going to go all the way around. And you don't have to be perfect because I never am. And just trace the thing. And now when you get down to the turning gap, there's a turning gap on your marked on your pattern. You also want to make a hash mark at the beginning and at the end, and keep and but trace all the way around. Okay, uh, now we have this trace. Let's look at it. Okay, there, it, there it is, and it's just enough fabric there. Make sure there's enough fabric on both layers that you that there's a seam allowance, and put the put your pin back in the middle. And now we're going to sew, and um, we're going to sew from from one end of the bottom gusset to the other end of the bottom gusset going over. Because uh, um, So we'll start here. Uh, you you want to use a relatively tight stitch because this will be stuffed. So, And you should use a color that you can see the thread on the fabric, especially on the bobbin side. Um, you, you just have to be able to see where your line of stitching is. Um, so what you're going to do, and this will, every beginning and end of every seam in this project, you're going to do a couple of stitches forward, a couple of stitches back, and then a couple of stitches forward. You want to really build up a tight knot there. So forward, back, forward, and also use your open toe foot. You, you absolutely need to see where you're going. Forward, back, forward, around, swivel, follow the line, doesn't have to be perfect. And there, go back, forward, back, forward, and then cut the thread. So um, I will go do that at the sewing machine, and then we'll come back. You can see we sewed from here with a few back and forth stitches, with a relatively small stitch to here, and ended. Uh, and the bottom is still not sewn. We are going to flip to the other side. I used red thread in my bobbin, just so you can see. I, I suggest you use something the same thread you use on the top. And now we're going to put our pattern back in because this this part you can't you can't tell what's going on there. 
So just fit it within the guidelines of the of the bobbin thread of the bobbin thread outline. And now we're just gonna again trace all the way around. And this time, because the turning gap is on the other side, you do not need to put the hash marks where the turning gap is because this side you'll you'll sew in one continuous uh, line. Okay, so now here's the back again, and this is drawn in, and, and this is stitched. So the, um, the next step is we're going to install the gusset. And we take our gusset fabric, and you can place it right on top. And make sure that, of course, it reaches all the way around with at least a quarter of an inch beyond the animal's edges. And what you do is you want your animal to be doing a split. You want this, you want these, uh, this flap open as far as these two stitches will allow. So what I like to do is I finger press it down. I, I'm looking at those two stitches that are just, just barely there. And then I'm going to open it up and pin one side. And then pull this again to make sure that it's a that it's a good split. I can feel that fold. I can see that this this knot is resting right on the fold, and then the fold ends. And now I'm gonna put this here. Okay. And now I'm where there's a lot of fabric here. I, I'm gonna take this to the machine, but I don't need this much fabric. So I'm gonna just do some cutting of the extra fabric. And uh, I could cut this even closer if I wanted to, to waste less fabric, but I'm just doing a rough cut just to get it. Okay, so now here, here we have the hippo doing a split. Two legs are this way, two legs are that way. The bottom looks like this. You're looking at the wrong side from the bottom. The right side is up. Okay, and now I will sew, first I'll sew the, the side with the turning gap. And the way I do that is I start, you can start at this end or that end, whichever you like. Again, you want to start stitching right after this stitching ends. You don't want to go over that stitching, although if you do, we can fix it, don't worry about it. But you want to start right there after the stitching ends, go forward, back, forward, down, around, and then at the first um, turning point hash mark that you reach, go back and forth a few times. Then jump, so this area is not stitched. Go forward, back, forward, down, around, and end there. And right before that last stitch, and go back and forth again. So again, from here, down to here, stop, jump, there to there. Going back and forth everywhere that you stop. Um, and I'll go do that right now. Sewn the bottom area. You can see there's the gap where I didn't sew and to there. And I only went through these two layers. Here's what the bottom looks like. There's the gap. There's the turning gap. Now we're going to do the opposite side. We flip this the other way. And we're going to go through only these two layers. And this time there's no turning gap, so it'll be one continuous stitching. Start here, forward, back, forward, all the way down. And forward, back, forward, and again, it doesn't matter if you sew from here to here, here to here, either way, as long as you start and stop with back stitches. So now I'm going to sew that side up. And the 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 back side, what was originally the back side, uh, the the bottom gusset in one continuous motion. You can see it was the back because it has the red thread there. And so now we have a delightful front and back and we're ready to start trimming. The way I like to trim is go in. First, First, I'm going to avoid the gusset area. I'm going to start about right above the gusset area, and I'm going to go in, and I'm, you, want to set, you want to cut a quarter of an inch from the, from the stitching line, and you also want to clip all the any curves. So there's an any. So you want to clip it almost to, but not quite, and don't go through the through the line of stitching. And I go all the way around. Okay, and there. 
there's the, the top is nicely trimmed. Now we're going to trim the, the gusset area, and this is a little bit tricky because you uh, you have to make sure you're not cutting through the red lines on the back. So we have these two legs. I like to fold the gusset in on itself first, and here I'm going to very carefully cut. Let's see, get that thread out of the way. Very carefully cut through the gusset for like a quarter of an inch. I can feel that I'm going through four layers, just enough to get beyond the fold. Then you open it up and you put your scissors in the hole that you created. Make sure you're only cutting two layers. And then cut again a quarter of an inch. Okay, and now here, I, 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 again, here we, you can see that I, we want to cut through the gusset again. So now I fold it back, so the four layers are together. I come up on it this way. I feel that I'm cutting through four layers for a quarter of an inch. Then open it up. Drop the back so that those two legs are out of the way. Insert my scissors so that I know they're only through two layers, and then cut away the rest. And now this, these two legs are trimmed. Let's trim these two, this side. This side here, uh, now I'm folding the, the first two out of the way. I'm inserting my scissors where I made that snip. I'm cutting a quarter of an inch away. Now at the, at the area in front of the turning gap, I like to leave a lot more seam allowance so that it doesn't fray when I'm hand sewing it shut. So I leave a half an inch, a generous half inch, maybe three quarters of an inch between the turning gap and the um, and the cut my cutting line, and then a quarter of an inch here, and then right here I want to make sure I don't make any mistakes. And again, I come up on it so that the gusset is folded, snip slightly, and then cut through two layers there. Okay, and uh, the, this needs clipping because of the any points. Okay, and what you will wind up with, with any luck, is this lovely hippo that is very flat and uh, can do a split. And the next step will be turning, turning the hippo. Now it's time to turn the animal, and in order to turn it, I use my favorite tool of all time, a, a five-inch curved neck hemostat, and this thing's great. It, um, it, it not only turns the animal, but also stuffs it, and I can't find anything that compares with this, especially when you're dealing with small animals, which are trickier. So right before we turn it, we just inspect it and make sure that there are no holes, that the that the gap that the threads meet more or less with a tiny gap is fine, and that uh, the bottom here it is it looks like a barbell, and the other side looks good too. And also make sure we've we've clipped all the innies, and we did that before. And along with doing it there, I made a few clips into there. And uh, on the side that doesn't have the turning gap, of course, you also need to clip uh, into that into that inward point. So, and don't go into the seam. And once everything looks okay, here, I'm gonna do some more clips down here on the curve under the neck. Uh, and I think that's good. And my philosophy of turning is that I reach for the, the furthest point that I can find. So the furthest point for me is the ears. And you'll see also at points like ears, I clip the seam allowance even l smaller than a quarter of an inch. And so I find my turning gap and go in with my hemostat. And the, since, that's the furthest, since that's the furthest point, I'm gonna start there and start pulling things through. And the point is to go gently carefully. You don't want to tear anything. You don't want to rip anything. And start pulling it through. Um, the great thing with the hemostat is that once, if there's something that's stubborn, you can go in again. And there will be stubborn things. 
this one is coming out really easily. That's unique. Then when you get to, here are some legs, I think, and with the hemostat, you can either go in into the inside, and from the inside, I like to do this with the hemostat, and that opens things up. So now I'm opening it, opening it, opening it, and that opens it up, and you can also go in from the outside and pull it out. Uh, maybe not in that one, but in this one here, there's a little room. I'm going to go in, and of course start pulling it out. So you can do a combination of working from the inside and opening, opening, opening to make that expand. Um, you can see the I'm opening it up and working from the outside when you need to. And try to get all those seams nicely extruded. There's another foot. So let's see if I can get in there and pull it out. And keep doing this until the whole creature is extruded. And now the whole thing is more or less out, and it doesn't have to be smooth around the edges. Once you start stuffing it, the, any remaining uh, areas will, will be pushed outward. You'll make sure to do that. So here the snout is mostly out, and then when I stuff it, it will be all the way out and everything looks good. But sometimes you find mistakes. I do, after I've done this, while I'm doing this, I find a little hole that I hadn't anticipated. I didn't know. I find I may need a little more clipping, like this spot might need a little more clipping. Uh, so it's not unusual to find mistakes. And then, yes, you have to, you can either, sometimes you can pull out just the part with the mistake and fix it. And sometimes you have to turn it all the way, uh, all the way back to being inside out. And the good news is that if you do have to turn it all the way back, the next time you turn it, it will be easier because it's done that once before. So once everything looks pretty good, we're going to stuff it. It's time to stuff our animal, our hippo. And I have my polyfill stuffing. It always takes more stuffing than you think it will. And again, I have my hemostat, and just like when we turned it, I look for the furthest points and fill those first. And uh, the furthest points on this guy are the ear, the snout, and the four legs. And so you work your way inward from the distant points to the closest and the center last, and then work your way out, like painting a room. So the, the, the stuffing should go in wispy, which is what it's like when you buy it. If you're upcycling stuffing from a different project or a fail, I find that it comes out clotted. So then to tear it apart so it's wispy. It will be packed in there, but when it goes in, uh, it, it shouldn't be a clumps. It should be wisps. So I am bringing it over. First, I'll get that little snout. And the ear, and then oh, I think I'll do the front legs next. There, I'll do the the one in the in the back, front back leg. That's and the back related to the turning gap. The turning gap's on this side. That leg's on the on the distant side. And then we'll do this leg. And then I will go for the back legs. And yeah, this does take time. And as you can see, I'm, I'm not only stuffing it, but I'm pushing the seam out further if it needs to be pushed out, which some areas will. And now, and the other thing you want to be doing, not so much with this pattern, but with all of them, is to be pushing the legs down. The legs are going to want to splay out because that's the way the gusset is, but we want these legs to fold. These gussets are all going to have a little fold in them where the legs are. That's how this method works. So now I've got the extremities pretty well stuffed and I'm gonna fill in the center. And it's amazing how much, how much fits in 
one animal. And you want to keep feeling, keep turning it. Often above the, above the legs, you can feel a gap. So as you go, keep feeling it and turning it and adding it as needed. And you decide how firmly you want it stuffed. Uh, so some of them require more. The, the, the giraffe has, has longer legs, and so they need to be stuffed pretty tightly where, uh, and the long neck, whereas a, a roundish animal like this one can get, doesn't have to be stuffed tight unless you want it tight. Anyway, so we're almost there. I'm going to keep going. It's going to take a few more minutes. And um, and once we like it, it's time to either, you, you could add embroidery or embellishment now, or you could just sew up the gap and and finish it. So since this is a plain one, I probably will want to embroider it before I sew up the gap. Uh, we'll start with an eye. Uh, here, This eye is a series of straight stitches, one long one in the middle, and then two sh progressively shorter ones on either side. That's a little difficult to do neatly, I find. This I find much easier. It's an asterisk, and it's made with, I start with doing a cross stitch, one stitch this way, one stitch that way, and then one across and one straight up and down. And I'll show you how to do an asterisk on our blank hippo. So. Start with your with a long needle. I use a, a single strand because I want to be able to unsew if there's any stitches I need to take out and cut it. And, and you want to put a significant knot at the end so that it doesn't pop out. And I would that means I would do at least two overhand knots and get them on top of each other. So first on my blank hippo, I will draw where I want the eye. I think I want it about there. And I'll just draw a little cross stitch there. Only I can see it. I drew my asterisk. Um, I have my needle. There's a knot at the end. It's a, it's a single strand. Um, I'm going to go into the hole that I haven't sewn up yet. If you have a real, the longer the needle, the easier this part is. And then have it come up at one end of your asterisk. Okay. And it is going to drag some, some stuffing out with it, so you just got to fight that battle. So I am going to do, a, first I'll do a cross stitch, one like this, one like this. And then I'm going to come do a straight up and down cross. So there, there, if you leave it like this, it looks like he's dead. It looks like a cartoon character with a crossed out eye. That's why I go for the asterisk. So now... I'm going to do straight down and come out straight to the side. And finally, this is going to be the final um, hole. And you're going to, uh, you need to decide here if you're going to move on to somewhere else. You might want to move on to make some whiskers or you might want to move on to make a mane. And if you're not moving on, uh, actually in this case, you're going to move on to do the opposite side. So. Here again, I'm going to do a cross stitch, one across, one across there. If you, if one of your stitches is the wrong size, you can pull it out because it's only a single strand. Go across there, and over there. Okay, and this is going to be our last insertion. So now, if you're if you're not going to use this green thread on anything else uh, to make anything to embroider anything else, you can tie a little knot. And I do only one overhand knot because we're going to pop this through the surface. And then you can either come out your hole, bring it out your hole, and pop the knot through the surface. Or if your hole isn't open, or you just um, don't want to reach that far, you can find a try to find an inconspicuous space. Pull it out, and then, heard that, then we pop the knot through the surface, and now we can, wherever the, wherever the thread is emerging, be careful, don't clip the fabric, and then massage the ends back in, just like quilters do with a hand, hand quilted quilt. So here we now have these cute little asterisk eyes. Uh, and now we'll, let's talk about doing some embroidery on the side. 
why not? Um, I like to. I, I find that I need to draw it. You, you can do it freehand if that's if you're good at that kind of thing. Just just make something up as you go along. Uh, but I usually need to draw something. So let's draw. We'll draw a vine. Um, we'll draw some feathers. Feather. Feather. Uh, feather. Um, feather. And now you can use whatever your favorite stitch might be. I, I like to use a back stitch for this, this uh, very simple project. So again, I'm gonna, I have, I have a knot at the end. I should make it a little bigger to make sure it doesn't come out. Oops, and you want your knots on top of each other. There we go. And we're gonna go in there. Start at the bottom. You can start anywhere you want. And then I take a small stitch. Then I move ahead a bit. And then go back in the hole where the last stitch ended. And then go, I'm gonna do this this part of the vine. And keep going like this. Whoopsie, it's, the thread will always wrap around a leg. And keep going. You get extra credit if your stitches are more or less the same length. I don't, I don't usually get too much extra credit for that. And keep going. And so forth. And here, this guy's going to curl in on himself. This, this line. And back there, and now I can return to where I was on the main vine and start going up that and so forth. And you keep on going, and when, then when, again, when you're when you're done, when you have, or when you're about to run out of out of thread, like I am here, make a make a knot about an inch from the or a half inch to an inch from where the thread emerges send it down to where you need it to go and here in this case we're right near the hole so we can come out the hole pull that's it knots under there trim this off and start again with a new with a new thread of course if you know any fancy embroidery stitches or you have a book of embroidery stitches this is a great place to play with them uh, again here's the hippo that I embroidered uh, these are mostly uh, uh, back stitches, and then I wrapped around each stitch uh, with a variegated thread, so it looks really pretty. You can see that here. I used a dark purple to do my straight stitches, and then I wrapped around them with a lavender thread. Here's a bunch of French knots. In this case, I used uh, straight stitches and then wrapped them to make the out outer outline of the eye. Uh, embroidering your, your beast is a lot of fun. Now we're going to sew up the gap in the hippo. Uh, if you have a big hippo, this should be really easy. With a charm hippo, it'll just be a little trickier because there's less area. I'm using, obviously you should use a thread that blends. I'm using one that, will, that you can see on the video. I have a significant knot at one end, single strand, so you can back out if you make any mistakes. And uh, the easiest way to sew, sew up your animal is with a whip stitch. So you go in and you want to hide your, hide your knot inside. So you push that knot inside if it needs to go in. And then you can just, with a whip stitch, you just catch two, a little bit of one side and a little bit of, other, of the next side, just a couple of threads. And you go around and then do it again, just going across a tiny bit, catching a tiny bit with each each time. That's the probably the most conspicuous stitch. Uh, it does the job, but you, you can see it, although if it's a, bl a blended thread, it won't show much. Uh, my, my favorite, my personal favorite for sewing these guys up is what I call a lacing stitch. 
<clears throat> and with that stitch, you you come in from, you approach each side from underneath, and you have to turn the animal with each stitch. So then I turn it. Now I'm emerging from the purple side, so I go down and emerge from the green side. Pull it up, turn it, go down again. Whoops, go down again and emerge from the purple side. Turn it, go down, emerge from the green side. I just like the way it lays, and I, it looks like the animal has had surgery, and his surgeon has carefully stitched up his wound. Um, the most invisible stitch is a blind hem stitch or a ladder stitch, and with that one, it's also tricky, and the legs tend to get in the way, so I rarely do it for these animals. If I were entering them in a show, or they needed to be perfect for some reason, I would, but... Uh, so here the thread is coming out of the purple side. I go directly across. I travel through the seam allowance of the green side, a scant, a, I don't know, an eighth inch or so. Come out and then go into the opposite side. Travel again for like an eighth of an inch through the seam allowance of the purple side. Come out. Oops. Come out and then keep going like that, going straight across through the seam allowance, coming out and straight out through the seam allowance and coming out. And you can see that this is a very, this hides the thread really well. Um, I don't know that it's the strongest. I would suspect that a whip stitch would, or a ladder stitch would be stronger, but um, I mean, a whip stitch or a, or a lacing stitch. Uh, so it's up to you, whatever whatever stitch you like and you're comfortable with. Um, it is annoying that the legs always get in the way and the thread always wants to wrap around. When you're ready to finish, when you're done, I, I do two tiny stitches in place. Because um, we want this to be really secure. And then with the last, the loop of the second one, I go through twice, one, Two, I tie a couple of overhand knots about an inch or a half an inch from where the thread exits. That's less than a half an inch, that's okay. Okay, so I have, well, there's two, but they're not quite on top of each other. Let me get them on top of each other. I got a significant knot there, and I'm gonna go back into the beast right next to where it emerges and pick a random location. Popped it under, it went under the surface. And now hold that down, clip it, be careful not to clip the fabric. And massage the ends in, and there you go. Uh, with your blending thread, you shouldn't be able to see the stitches as well as I can see them here. And there you go, He's, he sits, he stands. He doesn't sit, he stands. He can do a headstand, that's kind of cute. Um, he, he needs more embroidery. If you want to do more embroidery, you absolutely can. Just pop the knots into, because with this is sewn up, you're going to have to pop your knots. I, I find popping them through through the bottom, uh, that's the most inconspicuous area. If you, if you do it through here, you might risk having either a hole or a run in the fabric. So if there's going to be a run, we'd rather it's down here than up on the, on the very conspicuous sides. Just a final word, uh, there are so many possibilities for the hippo because his side is broad, you can fit a lot on it, and you already saw this lotus embroidery inspired by William the Hippo, and you saw the bird. This is a novelty fabric, not embroidered. Here I used a beautiful print, and I cut it so that the eye, uh, a, a part of the print that looks like an eye would be over there. Of course, I didn't do that on the other side. You, you should probably do the same thing on both sides, but I didn't, never mind. Uh, here, I put a giant flower on one side, and this is a uh, vintage applique, a vintage fleur-de-lis applique, and I just couched it in place. Uh, and here he's got little button eyes. Of course, you do not put button eyes on any gift that's intended for a small child. They will choke on them. Uh, it's very dangerous, so stick with embroidered eyes if this is a gift for a young child. Uh, embroidered uh, button eyes are good if, the, if it's a gift for an adult or a teen.
uh, th this guy has also got a nice flower on the side. And then you saw this side already with the, with the swirls. That was a lot of fun. And here's the one I started earlier. I still haven't done this side. And the, the vines, I filled out the vines. I added asterisk flowers, and now he's got asterisk eyes and asterisk flowers. That may be a little too much of a good thing. So I have fun with the hippo pattern. It's really one of the easiest because it doesn't have a, a head gusset, just the leg gusset. So it's a really fast project and, and with infinite possibilities for embellishment.